And now our Healers Roundtable, we had a, a rousing and mellow uh, Qigong session that everybody who, who returned from the terrace was like, oh my gosh. And it was only like 20 minutes. I don't know what you did out there, but it was only 20 minutes and people were like, ah, oh, I, can, I can just, I just feel like everything's changed. My life has changed. So um, that was with Dr. Carol Penn, who is one of, of our healers. She is to my immediate left. And Dr. Carol Penn is a physician specializing in integrative family practice medicine with a focus on mind, body medicine, arts medicine, and nutrition medicine. Um, prior to beginning her career in medicine, Dr. Penn, an award-winning choreographer trained in New York City with the world-renowned Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater. Um, she is on the faculty of the Center for Mind, Body Medicine in Washington, DC. She's a certified yoga instructor, member of the National Qigong Association, a Reiki master and teacher, and just an amazing woman. So welcome to Dr. Carol Penn. And yes, we can clap, we can, we can interact. And uh, to, to Carol Penn's uh, left is Dr. Robin Alston, and she is the founder of the Ashe Yoga Studio in uh, East Falls, uh, Ashe Yoga Studio and Tea Room. And she's the author of a phenomenal book called The Art of Feeling Good, The Power of Ashe Yoga. So welcome, Dr. Robin Alston. And to her left, you may hear her on, uh, is it the third Friday? Second Friday of, um, of the month when she either co-hosts or sits in for Brother Shamari on the Shamari show. It's uh, Araka Rotharandu. And she is a nationally acclaimed empowerment specialist whose work is rooted in Egyptian history and philosophy. She has written several publications, Answers, a Philosophical Foundation for an Empowered Life, um, which is a how-to for personal empowerment, When Loving God is Not Enough, a workbook, on expanding spiritual empowerment within religious faith and path to power, the making of a new African. She's also CEO of Ma'at Enterprises, a comprehensive empowerment conglomerate with four subsidiaries. So welcome to Araka Rothrandu. So the, the whole idea of, of this panel, the whole idea of the Healer series, um, and we met for about two hours on the, uh, I think it was like the second Saturday of the month uh, for four consecutive months. So we have three out of our four healers that participated in the, the series. And it was really, the, the, the whole point of the Healer series was to invite healers who can, can share their wisdom, their experience, their expertise in how to de-stress, how to manage um, and, and take better care of ourselves with strategic um, practices, with, with real tangible practices that we can use. And so I'm, I'm really happy that, that the three of you have been able to come because we are living in very stressful times. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we are living in, in very stressful times, I would dare say traumatic times. And um, my father was a healer, so it, it, it was really important to me to integrate some type of healing conversation in Founders Day because he was um, you know, a, a, a medical doctor. He was a, a classically trained medical doctor, but he really understood the art and science of, of healing and medicine. And so one of the things that, that I witnessed with him, and I think is probably um, applicable to what's happening right now, is that I saw with him sometimes that healers um, were the repositories for other people's pain and fear and grief, uh, because they're dealing with, with um, other people's illnesses and, and threat of illness and things like that. So as we look at this moment in time when many people, many of our people are feeling particularly traumatized and we're all swimming in the same stew of, you know, stress. Um, I'm wondering if each of you could speak to how you, as people who care for other people, are taking care of, of yourselves in this moment, um, or if maybe you're not taking care of yourselves <laughs> in this moment. But, but just to, to start there, and then we'll, we'll unfold from there. So I'll start with you, Dr. Carol Penn. All right, well, first of all, thank you so much, Sarah, and Word for having me, and it's wonderful to be here as a part of Founders Day and honoring your father. So to answer that question, I, there are times when I'll, I'll admit where there's been an ebb and a flow where I am so other-focused 
that I don't always take care of myself in the way to optimize my own health. And then as, as I step away from that, my, my body quickly tells me that I'm, I'm you know, going down the wrong path and I, I'm usually able to bring myself back. I am fortunate to have a number of practices. And one of the things that I'm looking at now um, particularly the sicker my patients are, the more trauma there is in my community and what they bring to me is what I would like to refer to as radical self-care. So I see my commute to work as a time not to listen. I might listen to 10 minutes of news and then I put on something that's peaceful or informative for the rest of the commute. Then I go and I see my patients. Um, I'm seeing around about 300 patients a month, um, so you know, do the math. It's uh, you know, it's a really rich and full practice. I'm I'm very blessed. I work with two medical practices, and then on my way home, same thing, kind of de-stress in the car. I've stopped taking a lot of phone calls because the car had become the rolling office, mm -hmm. you know. And also, that's where you raise your family and you check in with your husband and you, you know, do your grocery list. So, you know, stopping that. And then when I get back in the confines of my time, that first hour belongs to me. So I'm either on to a yoga class or I'm on to a workout or I'm on to an hour of meditation. But that first hour before I set foot in my door is mine. So those are some of the ways that I've inter, interweaving it into my day and you know, honoring myself. I deserve it, I'm worth it. I take care of a lot of people and if I'm gonna keep doing that role, I need to be absolutely, completely and totally in love with myself. Mm. Wow, well that's a, that's a, that's a, a mindful, <laughs> you know, it's a mouthful and a mindful. So, so Dr. Robin Alston, what about you? How are you, how are you managing amidst this um, kind of trauma-informed world we live in? Okay, let me start by saying thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you to the Word family. Thank you to Dr. Lomax for allowing this to happen. Um, I like to say I do what Dr. Carroll did, <laughs> but what I actually do is I've rearranged my life over the years to um, de-stress, um, you know, I am a breast cancer survivor, uh, 20 years, and for, <laughs> and for me, um, it's real when you know that your body can get out of control, if, and it's the external world, but it's also the internal world. I am a practicing psychologist, I'm a professor at Lincoln University, so I'm constantly seeing people and doing things, so Yoga is really my life. I believe yoga is an experience. It's not so much the movements. All of the energy works come together, whether it's yoga, qigong, tai chi, they all complement one another, but it's the practice. It's how often you do it. But one important thing that I've learned over the years is that how we breathe is so important to our health, to our emotional health, to our physical health. So most of us think, okay, we're breathing, but the question is, how are we breathing? Um, are we taking in deep breaths? Are we breathing from the right nostril, the left nostril? So I've really, really been studying breath and realizing that a lot of our breath is based on what has happened to us. So we're breathing that fright or flight breath where we're afraid, we're stressed. Doesn't it have to be something happening on the outside? And so, in the yoga studio, we spend a lot of time focusing on breathing, and a lot of people will come to me afterwards and say, I didn't realize I was breathing out when I should be breathing in, I was breathing in when I should be breathing out. But the science, the research is so apparent now that 70% uh, of our waste is released through our breath. And so I've been practicing yoga for over 20 years. It's my life. And so for me, I'm here. I've seen my whole family um, pretty much disappear from diseases like hypertension, diabetes, and some of these diseases are so preventable. Some of these deaths are so unnecessary. And this time, what's happening now for me, it's more important how we respond to the stress rather than how we react to the stress. And getting together with a community, connecting with Word Radio, 
connecting with yoga, not as something you do as an event, but as a practice, as a community. I thank you very much. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Robin Alston and Araka Rothrandu. What are you doing in the midst of these kind of hectic times? Well, first of all, like everyone else, I want to express my appreciation for being here and give honor and praises to your father, our ancestor, who has made all of this wonderful empowerment possible. Thank through you. Through you. Thank you. Um, and, and my family. My, oh, my absolutely. mom. <laughs> And my brother. This, oh, yeah. And, yeah, you had something to do it's, with it, it's, too. It's, 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 there's definitely a village going right. on up Outer in here. Honor and praises. Honor <laughs> and praises. Um, well, I was born a Libra, which is an air sign. We are governed by the mind. And so I, my sacred calling is to empower people by putting them in touch with their own personal power, the power of the mind. All of the things that we have to deal with are governed by what we think. So in protecting myself and healing myself, replenishing myself, I start with thinking. I do not think of myself as in, it's swimming in trauma. I do not think of myself as a victim. I do not think of myself as oppressed. I think of myself as an empowered black woman living in the United States of America who's got some work to do. And, and in, in just that thinking, I, I am not allowing what is happening around me to be inside me. I also focus on the difference between stress and distress. Stress is wonderful. Without stress, we would lay in bed all day and watch cartoons or anime or old movies. Stress is what gets us up in the morning and moves us forward. Without the stress, and stress is opposition, there are things that oppose you in order to give you an opportunity to create. That's the point of stress. So stress is wonderful. Distress is a choice. It's how we choose to experience the stress. And I do not choose to let anything that opposes me and gives me an opportunity to create myself to cause negative vibrations in me. And I'm human, you know, something happens and you get upset, you get angry, but I talk through it. I have several people on speed dial, work through that emotion and then engage the power of my mind to create my reality. That's power, the ability to create your own reality. So think whatever you need to think in order to keep yourself from internalizing the madness that is the United States of America in 2017, because none of it belongs to you. None of it is yours. Don't take it on if it's not yours. So that's how I, I, I protect myself, that's how I heal, and, and I look forward to continued discussion about how each of us can make choices about how we're gonna live our lives. Well, one of the things that I want to incorporate into um, today's conversation are some specific uh, strategies, some specific practices that we as, as, as a community, as individuals can employ to, to manage. Because, I mean, so, so I hear you, I hear what you're saying and everything. However, <laughs> I think that most people are really um, struggling That's right. with this moment. Mm -hmm. And so, so one of the questions that, that I have for all of you is, you know, we are seeing a resurgence in resistance and protest and um, real, um, you know, amplification of uh, just, just, fighting against what is happening in this, in this country, in this moment, which is a good thing. However, I think a lot of us are animated by anger or fear or frustration, and that is what is driving kind of the, the, um, the activism. So my question is, how do we activate our activism without destroying ourselves by the rage and the hate and the fear and the frustration that sometimes is what is the motivator for that activism. So um, I'm gonna start with you, Missy. I'm gonna start with Carol Penn, because I know Araka's like, I got this, I got this. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, start, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with, she's got it too. Go ahead, Dr. Carol Penn. Well, one thing I invite people, Raka, as you were saying, you know, you do have your emotions. You do yes. get angry. You do yes. get upset. You do get sad. However, don't dwell in them. Don't stay there in the negative emotion. 
So this, all of those negative emotions can be transformed, again, through the power of your mind. So you want to keep developing and cultivating strength of mind. If you were out there on the terrace, I said there's three ways. At the beginning of every Qigong practice, it's also very much intrinsic to yoga, as Dr. Robin has been sharing. You start, we start with correcting the breath. You just heard Dr. Robin talk about the breath. So you learn and you study your breath. Your breath is your link to what's happening with you in the moment right now, emotionally and spiritually. It's also your link to your past, and it also creates your future. Then you correct your posture. So we want to deal with the health of the spine and the physiology. You know you're as old as your spine is inflexible or as you're young as your spine is flexible, whichever way you want to look at it. So you want to keep that, that river of light, that fluidity that is the creator made in your own bodies lengthened and alive and vibrating and, and you want to be aware of that. And then finally, you correct the mind. Those are the three intentful corrections in a Qigong practice. And, and you see that repeated in many variations throughout many mind-body practices. And then also the recognizing of the negative emotions, recognizing of the pain. I'm doing a lot of work now with, you know, looking back. And, and, and recognizing, yes, I am the descendant of people who have experienced historical trauma. And a lot of that trauma is being evoked in the modern day. You know, so many of us, okay, I thought we were through with that. I thought that was back there. We were past there. But also, so from that, going back and healing that and looking back at that historically, also looking at the jewels of resilience and resistance that have also always been a part of our history and bringing that forward in mind, body, and spirit. So being in a room like this, for example, is another practice. Don't you all feel good being here? Yes. This is medicine. This is powerful. This is healing. Absolutely. So, so Dr. Carol Penn, you, you mentioned um, kind of that historical, that historic trauma, and, and I do want to get into that, but um, Dr. Alston, do you want to, do you want to weigh in on how do you not burn yourself out or up in the process of um, being in the fight? Because I think, I, I would assume we're all in the fight. I'm just taking that as like a, uh, an, a, a given that, that all of us recognize the times that we are in and how serious they are and how we all need to get in where we fit in, but we also have to take care of ourselves. So the, that's the question is how do we balance that tension? Well, I must say, again, that I've had some great teachers in my life. And one of them, Dr. Asa Hilliard, used to always use the word clarity. Clarity. It may sound like a simple word, but clarity is so important. And for me, even when I look at my trainings, I've been to India, I've studied, and I realize that the uh, way that is taught sometimes is to be in the present moment but we can't be in the present moment until we understand the past. That's right. And in understanding the past, you take that past and you do transcend it, transform it, but you can't move beyond it until you understand it. So some of what I feel is happening now is that we are having a, a recall, a psychological recall. I'm a child of the 60s, of Martin Luther King. I understand, I have been called nigger, I understand. But I also, as um, Erica says, I make the choice, I have made the choice over my life to not be a victim, to not be a victim to cancer, to not be a victim to my circumstances. And in doing that, I had to understand what was going on. Some of what we're feeling right now has to do with history, but also with our own personal history. Anger only affects you. It doesn't affect the other party. So what we have to do is take that anger and transform it. And where you buy your, your, your clothes from, what you listen to on the radio, that whole concept of empowerment is that you feel powerless. A professor talked about learned helplessness. 
And so for me, it's empowering myself by making the choices that I make in life. But I believe when people come to me and they say, well, what to do? Well, part of it is what are you doing every day? What life choices are you making? What foods are you eating? So the radical transformation has to do with yourself. The understanding piece is understanding why is this happening? There's a saying, if you forget your history, you're bound to repeat it. If you forget your history, you are bound to repeat it. We have to take some responsibility, personal responsibility, for sometimes forgetting our ancestors, forgetting our history. We don't want to repeat it. And so understanding to me is one way that we don't repeat it. Um, and so my journey, my, I believe my purpose, my dharma, is to take what uh, the creator has given me and to share it with others and find out that the key is not to deny, but to be aware. And then when we do that, we do transform the breath. We transform ourselves, we transform our community, and we transform the world. Thank you. That's Dr. Robin Alston. Um, so we're gonna go to you, Araka, Sister Araka Ruthrandu. Um, you know, and, and I, I think that, that as we look at all of this conversation around monuments and the fact that, you know, the, the Confederate monuments and, and the Rizzo statue and all of these things that are now front and center um, around a trauma and Donald Trump saying, you know, well, what about Thomas Jefferson? And, and I'm saying, take them all down. <laughs> take them all, every last one of them, take them down. However, it's, it is, we are at a moment where our country, everyone is looking at our history. You know, it's not just us who are, are saying, you know, take the Confederate, you know, the, the, this, there's, a, there's a come to Jesus kind of thing going on right now. And I think that, that it speaks to and it allows us to really examine that historic trauma, that historic uh, reference point. So, so what say you? Well, a lot's been said and a lot's <laughs> been asked. <laughs> I, I, my, my work is like the stairs between where we are and where we say we need to be. Because we often say, you need to do this and we need to do that. And then everybody goes, yeah. And then it's like, how? <laughs> so I want to touch on what's already been said by my blessed and beloved sisters and talk about how. All right. First of all, we're not fighting against anything. We should be fighting for. And part of the challenge, one of the reasons why we're still in the same situation we were in since 1865 is because we have been fighting for validation by other people instead of fighting, fighting, and fighting against their hatred of us instead of fighting for ourselves and our self-determination. So one of the problems is we don't know what we're fighting for. Talk about Asa Hilliard, God bless him, and clarity, okay? And that clarity comes from history. The single most important thing you can do to keep your mind right is know our history from our perspective. Because when you know our history from our perspective, you understand none of this is new. There's no resurgence. There's no uptick. This has been our situation in this country all along. We've just been what? Resilient. I have challenges with that word. I appreciate that we made it this far. I get that. And I honor the ancestors who brought us this far. But I have challenges with the world resilient because when we focus too much, not too much on resiliency, we frame our struggle as being surviving. Oh, we got to survive this oppression. How are we going to survive racism, white supremacy? I, I'm for eliminating it. I'm for mitigating its impact on us. And that is possible if we all turn our attention to that. Understand where you are and how you got to this place. That's where the clarity comes from. That's when you know what you're dealing with. And once you know what you're dealing with, you know how to deal with it in a way that is authentic to you, where you are in your personal development. How do you fight hate? You fight it with love. I want to throw something out for you. This is going to be in my next blog, my spiritual empowerment blog, that's going to be hard to take. You ready? OK. White nationalism is self-love. Huh? <laughs> what? Black nationalism is self-love, right? Black nationalism says, I love myself more than I love anybody else. I love my people more than I love any other people. And I want a right to self-determination. So if it's good for the goose, it's what? Good for the gander. 
So what we're calling hate, other people call love. And if we stop reacting emotionally because it is diametrically opposed to us, then we can think about it and put it in perspective and get what? Okay. Clarity. Yeah, clarity. Okay, that, let me just say, that's going to take a minute for me to digest. I know. I'm going to I'm gonna okay, have, to, so I'm gonna my, have to marinate my, on that my one. My spiritual empowerment <laughs> website is vibrationsrising.org, and that blog is going to be posted so you can read it through because I make the case. All right? So, so part of it is the nature of our struggle. Can, can, can I just, I, I just, I just want to push back on that just a little bit, only because, to me, white nationalism in its, its basic construct is anti-black. That's not it, true. It, it, it is true. That is, that, is the way it, that is the way it manifests itself because, because of the power dynamics, and I know that we're going to disagree probably on this, but the power dynamics that exist in this country in terms of, of, of financial well-being and, and wealth creation and all of those things, there is a wealth gap. There are, there are very clear markers of inequity that exist in public education. You know, you can name I, them. Uh, yeah. so, so, so when you say that, that white nationalism is just about self-love, I disagree because I think that it also is about oppression. It is also about taking that self-love and using it as a weapon to, to, to um, oppress okay. black people. I understand and I agree with you. The challenge is that we confuse white nationalism with racism, with white supremacy, and and okay, not yeah, they, and are, they are all conflated they, to me. They're con in they're, my mind, they are all the but same. But they're thing. not the same. They're very, 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 very okay. different. And what's happening now is the others are all coming under the banner of white nationalism, which is about sovereignty. They hate us. They don't see us as human, and they want to live in a place where they don't have to deal with us. I respect that because guess what? <laughs> I feel the same way. <laughs> all right. So even if even if what you're saying is the truth, so what? I don't care if they hate me. I care if they stand in the way of me clothing myself, feeding myself, uh, and being able to, to take care of my children. And white people don't have very much to do with that once we decide that we're going to do that for ourselves. So again, it's the Nick, mm. how are we going to deal with this? Are we going to continue to beg for equality? Are we going to continue to, uh, to petition a system that has let us know consistently it absolutely does not respect our right to life, much less liberty in the pursuit of happiness? Or are we going to say, okay, you've shown me who you are. I know where I live. What am I going to do about it for myself? We can't change the way they feel. I don't care how they feel. What I care is how, the, how they feel manifests in their, my vulnerability to their hatred. So I'm going to deal with my vulnerability, not their hatred. Thank you. All right. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll take this up at another time. I'm not going to derail the conversation by just going. Yeah. Back it is and what forth. it is. It is what it, it is. It is what it is. It Clarity. Is, it, it is what it is. Well. So let's stop saying, why is it this way? Why? Why do you hate me? You shouldn't hate me. Here's a history lesson. You don't understand. We're all the same. They ain't trying to hear that. And meanwhile, we're spending time, energy, and resources trying to change their mind and their behavior instead of changing our minds and our behavior. I hear you. Moving on. <laughs> Moving on. Just want to uh, let folks know that we are broadcasting live from the Skyline Room at the Free Library, 1901 <laughs> Vine Street. Please come down and join the conversation. Uh, we're on the fourth floor. We are having our kind of quasi healers. <laughs> <laughs> quasi, quasi, no, this is healing. Qu quasi healers. This uh, is healing. Session. This is a far cry from Qigong. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> However, um, I deeply, deeply respect and appreciate um, Sister Araka's uh, uh, passion and views and, and history and, and, and um, intellect. So, you know, I, um, I don't necessarily agree with it 100%, but that's okay. That's I don't right. have to. That's right. It's this okay. Is, this is about um, Many paths to the sharing. Same yeah, but at the end of the day, we are about empowering and, and clarity and clearing our minds and our spirits and our hearts. So um, I do want to want to move to something that's a little bit more um, physiological, and I'll shoot this to you, Dr. Penn, because um, 
we know that, that racial health disparities are a real issue in, in our community. And you are a, um, a doctor who works in the physical realm as well as um, in, in other realms. But I wanted to see if you could talk a little bit about, because so many of the people in our community, whether it's because of historic trauma or, or uh, diet or lack of exercise or, or genes or whatever, are struggling with physical yes. challenges, health challenges. And I want to see if you can talk a little bit about what are some of the strategies around, you know, um, physical well-being that we as a community need to be concerned with. We absolutely need to clear our minds and, and, and nourish our hearts and our spirits. But we also need to take care of this, this body that is the, is the vehicle that houses all these other things. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, and, and yes, I feel like I, I am a person who is of both worlds. First initially trained in the whole aspect of yoga and Qigong and meditation, and then went to medical school and was traditionally trained in, in Western medicine. So always wanting to integrate and bring the bridge together. Uh, for for both of them because it's very difficult to carry out one's purpose in life if the vehicle the body is diseased so how do we rid ourselves of this disease process diseases of the mind diseases of the body and many 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 diseases that manifest in their body if you go to what's in back of what's in back of what's in back of, they have their root in our mind and in back of that in our spirit. So part of what I, I, I work on, again, is kind of bridging the two, is trying to get people to understand that, that disease can manifest itself in many, many ways. And we have, in the West, we have a name for this. It's arthritis, it's cancer, it's rheumatoid arthritis, it's gastritis, it's gastroesophageal reflux disease, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we got a pill for this and a pill for that. And, and, and diabetes, another one, hypertension. But you, you've heard the words here at this table, and you heard the word love, you've heard the word spirit, you've heard the word breath. If I can get people to understand that that's, that's the everyday work, that's the tilling of the soil, that's the tilling of the garden. Um, patients that I see that get better are the patients that really are cultivating the power of the mind. That's right. Cultivating the power of that mind. And that's when I really, I see, I see miracles happen. Mm. Absolute miracles. One of the reasons why people after 15, 10, 15 minutes of Qigong start to feel so good, if, you, if you're listening, all the language is about tapping into self, is about coming into the power centers of the body, is about feeling the breath down below your diaphragm or down deep in your gut. And then the natural healing hormones or biopeptides that are released first in your brain, and then just filter down into your body at exactly the right time, at exactly the right dose. And in those few minutes, you are transformed. You just start to feel your spirit lift. People say, I was in pain when I started. Five minutes, they have no pain. That's, right. That's very, very common in practices like Tai Chi, Qigong, and yoga. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's both parts of it. It's both parts of it. The medicines that you take, those medicines are going to work better, quicker, faster, last longer in your body as healing tools if you've got the other. The mind being right, the self-love, connection to the breath. The surgery that you have is going to do what it needs to do. Again, if these other three are connected, you're going to heal faster. The body has its own intrinsic healing properties. And that's so much of the work I do, getting my patients to understand that you are the captain of the ship. 
You know your body better than anybody else on the planet knows your body. The best I can be is to be your healing partner. That's the best any doctor can be, is to become a true partner in your healing and help you on your journey. And then we have some tools that can assist with that, whether it be medications or whether it be surgery, because there are times when you need those. And there are times when they can make a critical difference. But the biggest difference, the primary difference, the key difference is what's happening up here. What you think and believe about yourself and about your ability to be well and to optimize your own health and well-being. Hmm. Yes, 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 yes. That's Dr. Carol. That's Dr. Carol Penn. Um, and, and I want to I wanna go to you. Um, Dr. Alston, because, you know, you are a, a psychologist, and so, you know, this, this whole thing of mental wellness or mental health and, um, is, it, and we know that, that there is a lot of undiagnosed mental disorders in, in the country, in the world, in, in our community, and, and the, the question is, you know, when, I mean, I, I am totally aligned with, with this whole notion of our mind is this most powerful healing um, tool, but um, how do you, as a psychologist, show people how to harness that power, tap into that power, and especially if there is a disorder? Because a mental disorder is not just something in your head. There, it's, it's real. And Absolutely. so, you know, and I think that that's something that, that our community a lot of times doesn't take seriously, that there are real mental health challenges and disorders that are physiological. Absolutely. And so you can't just necessarily pray it away or, you know, it, it needs to be addressed in, in concrete ways. Um, thank you so much, Sarah, for the question, because for me, I have this big book called the DSM-5 that gives you all of these diagnoses and uh, labels that you place on people. And so I'm also an Ayurvedic practitioner looking at it from Ayurvedic um, perspective. Ayurvedic is the medicine for yoga. And so our Vedic says that we have three doshas. Everybody has a dosha in here, a constitution, some way that you are. And so if you are vata, you are very, very, um, you move a lot. You're like the wind. Vata is the wind. You're always going somewhere. You go somewhere so much sometimes that you exhaust yourself. You know, you're busy. Like, I got to go here. I got to go there. You never say no. The question is balance or imbalance. So that's one dosha. It's not a bad dosha. It's a dosha, but when it's out of balance, then that creates a problem. The other dosha we're going to look at, which I always tell people um, that the president, President Barack Obama was probably this dosha, and that's pitta. It's fire. Fire, you need fire because fire moves you. It makes things happen. Um, and so it's one of the elements that we need. But when you're out of balance, and you're fiery, what kind of disorders would you be more inclined to? Hypertension, problems with the heart. The third dosha is kapha. That I always tell people, if you're married to a kapha, they'll never divorce you, not because they don't love you, they just don't feel like it. <laughs> you know? like, I don't feel like it. You know? So. Kaphas are very laid back. Sometimes they're your couch potatoes. And so we say we treat a vata like a flower. We treat a pitta like a friend. You don't want to get them mad. And we treat a kapha like an enemy because in treating them that way, you get them to move. And you want them to move. Go out. Go to work. You know, do something. <laughs> get off that couch. But we have to know who we are. It's goes all the way back to our Egyptian, our comedic history, know thyself. That's where health began. Dr. Penn says, you know your body better than you. I can tell when my blood pressure is going up and I can tell how to calm it down. You know, I had one doctor say, your best weapon against your family history is yoga. He didn't need to tell me that, but I understand. But the, what I work with primarily Sarah, is energy. We have these amazing 72,000 energy centers. Think about that. We have seven major energy centers in our body. That is 
ammunition against any drug that you may get. Because that means that if my root chakra is blocked, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. I'm not grounded. I really don't think if God is taking care of the birds, the bees, even the ant that's flowing on the ground, I know it's going to take care of me. That's right. But that fear blocks it, and that obstacle blocks it. If my sacral chakra is blocked, so I work a lot with finding out what's blocked in terms of I don't diagnose a child with ADHD if I can help it, if I'm not in my, real, my other life as a psychologist. I may say to the parent to have a vata disorder. You can put something in balance, back to, in balance, back to balance, but it's difficult to take a pathology, a disease, and heal it because you have nowhere to go. It's a terminal thing. I'm always gonna be ADHD. Rather than saying, no, you can become balanced. Bipolar, again, a lot of times people come and say to me they've been diagnosed with bipolar, when sometimes it's something else going on in their life that they are just not able to cope with. And so the emotions go up and down, up and down. But I think that as a society, people feel better when you're not throwing the labels on them and when you're telling them that you can, you can, with the power that you have with these energy centers, open up your solar plexus, your, your stomach, where all these digestive organs are, open up your heart, forgiving yourself, forgiving others. This Fashuti chakra is what we're using today. I may carry a stone, I use stones, I may carry a stone with me to work with my Vashuti chakra. I may look at essential oils and work with people. I may put someone in Shavasana, which is a corpse pose to just let them relax, allow their parasympathetic nervous system to activate instead of uh, this overdrive that we have. I don't have a television. Mm. I don't have a television. My son called me the other morning from New York and said, Mom, you got to get ready. There may be a nuclear war. You gotta, you, I'm going to send you some food from Amazon. I said, why? What's going on? You don't know. This is serious. This is serious. I'm like, oh, poor child. And he's really, because he's watching TV right. all of the time. That's, right. that That's getting right. into your senses. You talk about the mind. If you keep taking in the same thing that's causing the problem, you'll never feel better. And so we get a little higher to that third eye. Our elders had this idea, this intuition, this ESP, knowing where you should be, where you shouldn't be. This ability to be the knower, this ability to know that if I go here, I'm going to create some imbalance. And then we get into this whole idea through a private practice that we are spiritual beings. We are spiritual beings, and we have to connect to that spiritual being. The meaning of yoga is yoking yourself to what? Being uni you united with the elements out there. We just had a, a solar eclipse. What does that mean That's to right. our bodies? That's right. What does the full moon mean? The full moon, people say, people get crazy, you're doing the full moon. No, if you were imbalanced before, you're going to be more imbalanced. That's right. So... Let's start telling the truth. That's right. And then we'll start feeling better. Thank you. That's Dr. Robin Alston. We are broadcasting live from the uh, central branch of the Free Library at 1901 Vine Street. Come and join us. This is our Healers Roundtable. I want to give a shout out to Senator Vincent Hughes, who is uh, in the house. And um, thanks to everyone. We have uh, the, the room is filling. Nick T is here. He's gearing up for the next panel, the host roundtable, which should be nice and fiery, so everyone should uh, stay around for that. Charles Ellison is back there. Um, and we are talking about healing. We're talking about this, uh, uh, this, this notion of taking ownership of our mind, body, spirit, our healing. And um, we are gonna open it up to questions in just a minute. I wanted to ask you, Iraq, and I wanna ask all of you, if there was uh, a, a tangible one, if there's anything you want to respond to that, that was said, please, please feel free. But also, if there was a tangible practice that you would want to share with, um, with our, our listeners, with our 
attendees uh, about how to just be more um, in their in the, in their skin, in themselves, grounded, rooted, um, and uh, alive. I'm going to answer both questions at the same time. I'm going to respond to what's been said because that's the answer to the question. Okay. Every word that my sisters have said, that's it. I may be fiery, but they have said the most revolutionary things on, on this panel. They are the revolutionaries. You are too. So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah. You know, when I, I first learned about the metaphysical sciences and heard Japanese names and Chinese names and Hindu names, I was like, eh, nothing to do with me, until I went to Egypt and saw on temples built 1,100 years before Christ images of us doing yoga, images of us doing Qigong, martial arts. That's, this is our science. This is how we were able to build the pyramids and they cannot be reproduced because as individual human beings, the priests and the, and the, the physicians of ancient Kemet reached a level of personal development that is unmatched in human history. This is the revolution. How do you heal? By, by subscribing to these sister services, by, by finding out about Qigong, finding out about uh, Marshall's breath, the, the ankh, the key to life. When a human being is born, it's the ankh being held under the nose. The first thing you do as a human is breathe, and the last thing you do as a human is breathe. And everything else in between is about breath. So I wanted to, to, to say that it really is about Every morning I take at least three cleansing breaths. Just stop. It's the Trinity. That's the Holy Trinity. Three cleansing breaths. And whatever you want to get rid of, that's what you exhale. So if you want, if you're, if you want health, you inhale health and you exhale dis-ease. If you're angry at someone, you inhale peace and you exhale anger. You, you, you do it. This is, this is your life and your body. It's, it's the power of the mind to move in the ways exactly described by these sisters. So thank you. Thank you all for your contributions. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so I'm going to ask each of you, and then we're going to open it up to questions. Um, Yashira back there is going to take the mic around in a minute. But if you were going to share a, a, a practice that, um, that we could all incorporate um, into daily lives? What would, what would that be? I'll start with you, Robin. Okay. For me, it's waking up, um, like Araka said, and breathing. Like when you look at the way you're sitting right now, some of us may be holding on something and it's stressing the, the nervous system. And so you want to relax the shoulders, make sure the head, the neck, the spine is in alignment and understand that you're taking in prana, ashe, which means the power to do. You're bringing in some vital energy into your system. Is everybody breathing in here? <laughs> ah, got you, got you, right? You think I had to think about that. Well, if we're not, then we're not gonna have conversation <laughs> in here. And so breath for me is really important. So the question is, how do you breathe? Well, I think Learning how to breathe diaphragmatically is step one. All breaths are not the same. So step one is how do you breathe so the breath is going deep into the lungs, expanding the belly, spreading the ribs a little bit, but keeping the chest a little steady, you know, and then making that breath long, slow, and deep. And how do you exhale? So breath awareness is something that's with me all of the time. It is really my weapon to feeling healthy, to being into situations where I may feel a little out of balance, I breathe. So that's one thing that I would use, um, Sarah, in terms of giving people something to, um, that they can take with them because your breath is with you all the time, right? And so you can use it. So focus on the breath. Um, the three things that I say is find the breath first, Feel the breath, and then focus on the breath. Thank you. Excellent. Dr. Penn. All right, so I will piggyback on that and build that because that's also how I, I start the day. It's, it's often what I, I teach patients, regardless of why they're there to see me, is, again, that breath. So from, from the breath, I would say we're going to be aware of our posture. 
We're going to learn to move through life connected to the breath and then lift and open this space in front of you, the heart, the fourth chakra, Anahata, so that you greet the world with this open heart so you're also able to receive and give from this space. It's very different when a person, so if I'm looking at this brother here and, and I'm doing this, I'm saying that I'm, I'm attending to you, I'm connected to you, we're a part of each other, versus if, if I'm here and I'm kind of holding back and closed off. It's, it's a whole different language without even my words changing, but it just, versus Mm -hmm. and that heart-to-heart -heart connection mm -hmm. that's giving us both life. That's mm -hmm. giving us both life. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Excellent, excellent. So at this point, so these are our healers, Araka Rotha Randu, Dr. Robin Alston, and Dr. Carol Penn. Um, we have time for questions. Um, we have a microphone right there. Does anybody have questions? We have a question back here. Um, and we're broadcasting live from the Central Library of uh, the Central Library, 1901 Vine Street. Come on down. I would like to thank you all. You have been healing me while I've been here, and I appreciate that. Um, I have a question about the terminology self-love, um, because I think that one of you had made a statement that uh, the white nationalists are using self-love, and this is why we have this, you know, one of these issues. But um, to me, that's not self-love. I, I look at, like, how do you explain self-love? Because to me, I'll be pretty transparent, you know, when we were growing up and we were very, very, very poor, we had food. And it seemed like that was love, but what happened is it caused a lot of us in our family to be overweight, with health issues, etc. So I want to understand what true self-love looks like, because that to me looks like hate. Okay. Mm -hmm. Played out. So, uh, since I made the statement, I'll respond. Yes, first. Araka wrote the okay. do <laughs> self love so, so first for of, white supremacists. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so first of all, let's define love. I use M. Scott Peck's love from the book The Road Less Travel. Love is the will to extend oneself for one's own or someone else's spiritual development. Now, you can replace spiritual with personal if, you know, spiritual ain't your thing. But it's about having the will, which is force, not coercion, not out of guilt, not out of obligation. You have the will to extend yourself, go beyond your comfort zone, break into new territory for your own or someone else's growth and development. That's love. Love is not a feeling. It is an act. Okay? So... Then we have to talk about in what context we're talking about self-love. I'm talking to this sister about self-love. It's going to be a different conversation. And if I'm talking about racism and white supremacy, it's going to be a different conversation. So let me clarify what I, what I said and what I meant. <laughs> I am a black nationalist. I love myself and I love black people more than anything on this planet. My vision of our lives has us self-determinant. Whatever that means, I'm going to let all the political sciences and economists work out the specifics. But at the end of that process, I want us to be unto and for ourselves because I'm clear that this, this vision of kumbaya ain't going to happen. Not in 75 or 100 years, maybe, with everybody working at it, but that's not, that's not the issue. We have this thing that America now is waking America ain't waking up. People in, in urban areas like New York and Philadelphia and D.C., where there is a melting pot and we have to deal with these issues, are dealing with these issues, but most of America ain't urban. And they don't even care what's going on. All right, so what, do, what, what did I mean? White, if black nationalism means I love myself and I will love my people and anyone who ain't good to me and good to my people gotta go, that's what white nationalism means. That's what I mean when I say for them, White nationalism is self-love. And the question becomes, why don't we engage in self-love on that same level? Why don't we put ourselves first, all right? Why is, for years, if you look at objectively at the struggle of black people in this country, it has been for validation of the missing two-fifths of our humanity from white people. 
And even now, as they shoot us in the street like dogs, we are talking about how can I get you to love me? I love myself, and if you don't love me, that's okay. I want the conversation of self-love for black people to be like the conversation for self-love for white people. Now, Sarah made an excellent point about the hatred, et cetera. That's mental illness. Those people are out of their minds. If you think that your truth allows you to take the life of another human being, something is wrong, okay? <laughs> we can talk about the DSM-5 all day and night, right? <laughs> so that's, that's mental illness. And, and I'm not talking about living my life in response to people who are crazy. All I need to do is know how to defend myself and get out of my community without using public transportation, okay? Period. That's all I need to do to think about people who hate me. It's how I'm gonna defend myself. But if I'm talking about fighting for what I want and not against what they want for me, that's self-love. Am I, was that clear? Yeah. Okay. So, um, other questions? Um, I, I didn't even introduce myself. I just assume everybody knows me. It's like, you know, sitting up here, everybody listening knows my voice. Uh, I'm Sarah Lomax Reese. I'm the president and CEO of Word Radio. Oh, Glenn yes. Ellis is in the house. Yeah. So, you know, I, 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 uh, I make great assumptions when, when I'm at word events, but um, it's very, very great to have everyone. We've got things are, are filling up as we, um, as we move through our, oh, our healers um, uh, program. You're listening to 900 AM and 96.1 FM Word Radio, Philadelphia. Thank you, Troy, for reminding me we need to do the station ID, take care yeah. of things. Um, we have uh, some, some other questions. I guess one of my questions that I struggle with a little bit, and I don't want to get into it too much right now, but to me, love is love. Love is love is love. So, you know, and, and so it should, it should show up um, no matter where, you know, no matter, no matter what color it's in or whatever, you know, it just seems like, like there's, there's some things about love that are like universal and it's not, I don't know, they should oh, express no, themselves well, can we, the same. Can we deal with that? No. <laughs> yes, we, we can, but I just want to get another, another question. Yes, sir. Okay, greetings. I have two questions, and hopefully I don't mess them up. Uh, Dr. Penn, what kind of medicine do you practice? And after you tell me that, are you looking for a student to shadow you? <laughs> Dr. I like Penn? to be a student to shadow you. Okay. Well... I'll, I'll give you the spiritual answer, and then I'll give you the answer that's on my license. Okay, so the spiritual answer is that I practice and I teach love. What's on my license is that I'm board certified in family medicine. I serve on the faculty of the Center for Mind-Body Medicine based in Washington, D.C., and I teach nationally different programs that the center designs, and I also co-design. And I'm on the faculty of Rowan University School of Osteopathic Medicine. So I also have an appointment in academic medicine. And I work in obesity medicine as well. So, so those are, but those, those are all the, the parts that gave me a certain platform and the ability to enlarge my territory because I believe that I've been a healer for time immemorial and that this is just how I chose to manifest in this lifetime at this time because it's recognizable and it gives me unlimited access to go and be and do whatever I want to do in the world and, and you know, standing on those academic accolades and those degrees. But really, so the, again, I, I just, my message is to get people to tap into those intrinsic healing properties. I'm also a DO, not an MD. I chose to become an osteopathic physician because I do believe that the body has its own healing intrinsic properties, and that's the first tenet of osteopathic medicine. A DO is similar to an MD in that we could be a surgeon or a neurosurgeon or a family doctor or an internal medicine or a pediatrician. It's just our training is a little bit different. I like the hands-on aspect of osteopathic medicine because I, I do believe in the power of healing touch and as an osteopath that's a part of my training in neuromuscular skeletal medicine and that translates to 
also what I brought forward as a yoga instructor. I'm also a certified yoga instructor. I've been practicing yoga and meditation daily since the age of 19. So, and I'm 60 now, so I just celebrated my 60th birthday. I've been wondering how old you were for years. Ah, You know, black black women, man, look great. There are people in the room? (laughs) So, but, and and the other, the answer to your other question is I would, you know, I'll give you my information, and yes, I do have people shadow me, and I do teach medical students and others. So, so let me just um, go back, because I, I was kind of joking, you know, Araka and I are cool <laughs> like that. I don't want people to think I was chumping or anything. So, Araka, go, go, if you want to answer that question about love, yes. love is love is love, I and then we'll go you. back to the audience. Yeah. I agree with you. Love is love. Love is the will to extend oneself for one's own or someone else's spiritual development. We are, we are, that's my definition, and it never changes no matter what the conversation but the way it manifests changes depending on the circumstances. So let's say you have a mother whose son is, what's the energy, um, the laid back? Kapha. Kapha. So you have a son who's got a Kapha dosha, is it? A Kapha dosha, hey, get it around. Right, yes. All right, all right, and, and, and he's got creativity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? He's getting up in the you know, late teens, what, tw- 20s, whatever. So mama goes out and she's getting information on how to do something and bringing it back and son, why don't you da 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 and cooking for him and doing his laundry and taking care of him and talking to him. And that's <laughs> love, right? That's how she extends herself for her son's spiritual development according to her definition. The other mother says, look, <laughs> here's, a, here's, here's some luggage. You got six months. And you're gone. The, the locks get changed, the whole nine. That too is love. That too is extending herself for her son's spiritual development. Two very different behaviors rooted in the same definition depending on the outcome and how we love. And, and the context in which I talk about this self-love piece for, for black nationalists and white nationalists is, who do I love first? I love me first. And if you don't love me, if you're not willing to extend yourself for my benefit, why, <laughs> why should I extend myself for yours? Particularly if there's animus and hatred and even violence involved. So it is, love is love is love, but how it exhibits itself depends on the circumstances, the people involved, and what the end goal is. And I submit that one of our greatest obstacles, black people, is the way we love. All right, that's Araka Rotharandu. I don't know if either one of you wanna, wanna say anything about that, but we have a question, we have another question over here. Yeah, right behind you, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, thank you for coming back. Oh, thank <laughs> you. Um, my name is Frances. I got a call, I got an email message yesterday from my cousin. Her grandson committed suicide oh, at wow. age 21. Mm. So I want to know how do you help young people at this time to not go that path? Mm. What, what directions can we give out to these young people? And how can I help my cousin and her son deal with the death of, her, of his son? Mm, mm, mm. Mm. Somebody say something. Well, well, well the, yes. the, the, the core of personal empowerment is understanding that you have control over your life and that whatever's happening around you are circumstances that appear real, but they don't have to be real. And putting things in perspective can help people. Now, unless they have a biochemical balance or something else wrong, and I'll, I'll leave that to the, the doctors here to, to deal with, but suicide is about hopelessness, it's about powerlessness, and feeling that you have no control over your life. So that would be the first thing that I would tell young people, you know, helping them understand what it means to be young, that what they're going through is absolutely right. They're supposed to be going through it. We went through it and we're still here. So that would be my way of, of uh, seeking to address that. Um, well, I, I guess yes. also for me, it's understanding the family and bringing the whole family in for healing. Um, I've had cases where one twin has committed suicide, so it's being aware that that other twin 
has a higher probability of doing it. Um, and the question, and usually there's so much more to the story than the act. And so um, it's really bringing people in to kind of dig into what is really going on into the family. And I get back to this word of understanding um, so that you can move forward. Um, but it is a tragedy and it must be dealt with. And so uh, yoga for me, again, um, there are eight limbs to yoga. People think it's just the asanas, but one of the primary limbs that I try to stress is you do no harm to yourself. And so that even though the suicide um, that's there, I also feel that sometimes we are committing suicide in some times of our behavior, mm -hmm. um, and we're not calling it that. That's right. And so I think it's this sense of hopelessness and helplessness. So I think, again, bringing the family, the, the total family, not just one member in for healing. Dr. Penn? So my condolences to you and your family. Suicide is often so, so tragic. And, and when I am in, involved with with a family that has suffered a tragedy like that. I agree with Dr. Alston again, you know, bringing the, the family together. And sometimes there is nothing to say other than to you sit, you breathe with that person, you kind of meet them where they are, you cry with them, you mourn with them, and do recognize there is a mourning period, there is a grieving period. And sometimes just being a you know, a, an active listener. So you're giving the, those who have survived an opportunity to give voice to the depth of their emotions and honoring that very, very deeply and honoring it, what comes up for you and honoring yourself during this time. And uh, we have uh, time for a few more questions and then we're gonna, we're gonna break. Um, uh, Yashira, yeah. Yes. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask about chakras. I think we have seven chakras. Is that correct? Seven major. Seven major. Seven major chakras. Yeah. chakras. Okay, so the chakra that takes care of the, the eyes. I just learned today that I have an ulcer on my cornea. So what chakra and do I need to work on to reverse that? Mm. Who wants to tap into that? <laughs> mm, vision, seeing. So I'll, I'll, I'll share my answer, and I'm sure Dr. Alston will share her answer. So the sixth chakra, right here between your eyebrows here, third eye, Ajna, seat of your intuition. Um, sometimes you'll see it depicted in a, a, a deep blue, an indigo blue. So sometimes wearing those colors, each, every color has a vibration and those vibrations can be healing to our physiology as well. And then developing or cultivating meditations around vision, seeing clearly, um, and, and being able to see clearly. So we go back to Dr. Asa Hilliard and that clarity. And so there's the vision of our physical eyes and then there's our spiritual vision and bringing those two into alignment. And then also, because there is an ulcer on the eye, finding a healing practitioner, an ophthalmologist, hopefully that who, who, who is open-minded, who will have the full discussion with you. So what's actually happening with the physiology and then what's happening behind that, what might be happening spiritually. So what is it that you don't want to look at might be a question that you ask yourself. And at the same time, you also do make sure you're not getting any infection, make sure the surface of the eye is not being dried out, and there may or may, may, or may not be a place for medications in your journey. Dr. Austin, do you want to add anything? Um, again, um, I look at the eye. We use our eyes an awful lot. And so it is close to the seventh chakra, which is highly vibrating at a higher spiritual level. And so asking yourself questions, using oils, um, 
using sound, so hum, om, again, looking deeper into what is it that you're seeing or not seeing um, is very important. Uh, again, laying down. Um, there are some eye movements that we use in yoga, but again, I would check with your doctor to see if those movements would be okay um, in terms of just strengthening the eye. Um, and uh, it's energy for me. I mean, I, I just truly believe that um, it's important for you to sit down and ask those questions. I'm looking at colors. Indigo is the color in that area. Looking at stones, um, I use sometimes pendulums to see where that energy may be blocked there. You may, it may be telling you that you're going to another level. It, couldn't, it may not be all bad. Sometimes we think when something happens medically to us that it's a bad sign. It could just be a sign of awakeness. When I had breast cancer, I realized it was near my heart, and I realized I needed to do work on my heart. I'm probably here today because of that. And so everything that happens medically to us is not necessarily negative. Um, so we're going to take uh, one more question, and then we're going to close things out. Um, Yashira, we have a question up here. This is going to be our last question, and then we're going to get a final thought from each of our, our healers, and, um, and then we're going to close things out. Yes, ma'am. Thank you um, very much. Speak um, into the mic. My name is Norma. I'm a registered nurse. I worked for the city for 30-some years. It wasn't until I went to work for the Lomax co company. You remember me, Norma? Yeah. <laughs> the prisons? Well, I, don't, I didn't work in the prisons. My I, brother worked in the prisons. He probably remembers you. But anyway. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. It was just wonderful. I, if I'd have had that kind of... Uh, relationship for 30 years with the city, I, I don't know what I would have done. <laughs> it was just marvelous. Oh. But, and, and I still, every single day, think about you and your family oh. and how wonderful you were to us. But what I want to say is my mother committed suicide. Oh. So did my sister, OK? That never, ever leaves you. You think about it every single day of your life. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you can advise other people to look out for it because it just comes. You, you, you're shocked. You, you, you don't know it. You, they start walking fast because they got, that's the only thing I, I can tell people. They walk fast because they got something to do. And they have to do it when you're not looking. Mm. So they're looking for every, every chance they get mm -hmm. to do that. So. Yeah, any, any, any strategies? One for identifying that someone might mm -hmm. be at risk and then, you know, any prevention um, strategies. Thank you so much for sharing oh, that welcome. story. Thanks. Yeah. And it's good to see you. And I love, oh boy, all of you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, do, do, <laughs> so, would would anyone like to to weigh in on on that very um, you know it's a it's a very painful um, story that was just shared, but like, it's really real. Yes, Iraq. I'd like to say something. We're in each other's lives to take care of each other. So if there's someone that you haven't seen for a while, haven't heard from for a while, call them, email them. Just leave them a voicemail, text, that they run off of the mouth and you don't have time, text them. Just letting you know I'm thinking about you and I appreciate you, because sometimes that's a lifesaver. Just reach out, this, this, you know, this, this thing and, and this isolation and, and it's becoming popular to be isolated and we're gonna see more and more people die from that sense of isolation. So gather when you can, visit when you can, reach out and, and let people know that you're thinking about them whenever you think about them, in the moment, real time. Don't put it off. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Anybody else wanna, yes. Go ahead, Carol. Well, 
Sister Norma, first of all, I'm sorry for your loss. And I love you. And I know it's something that you live every day. Um, oftentimes, when, when a person takes their own life, it, it's, it's a reflection of a, such a deep disturbance in their spiritual being, in their psychological and their emotional being. Um, oftentimes, uh, when a person uh, takes their own life, these are diseases or disturbances or imbalances in primarily the sixth and seventh chakra. A, a balanced seventh chakra connects us to our highest self, or a sense of what is higher and greater than ourselves. So that's one place for all of us to, to guard in that area, guard your mind, guard your thoughts, right. cultivate positive emotion for yourself so that your brain is able to release the hormones of serotonin and dopamine and balance out your autonomic nervous system, which is your sympathetic and parasympathetic. Sympathetic is your fight or flight, parasympathetic is your rest and relax. And again, is we're now learning that if we're able to bring forth that relaxation response, that is the place where miracles happen. So that's where, you know, in science we call it, you know, spontaneous healing or remissions, and science cannot yet explain it away. But these are the deep mysteries of what it means to be human, this is the deep mystery of what it means to love yourself. This, to me, is the definition of self-love. And to, first of all, have that in your own life. And then when you have people in your life that you're sensing are out of balance or that are troubled or are difficult and, and you're seeing balance, you know, how, you know, if you're calling it in the doshas or in the chakra system, listen to them. If someone uses words of self-harm, take them seriously. You take that seriously. You never say, oh, well, they'll never do it. If you could get them in front of a sensitive health care provider, either in mental health or uh, family medicine or internal medicine, because it is a, an emergency. You, because the next step is, you know, does that person have a plan? But if you can't get them in front of uh, an experienced provider, and hopefully someone that can also be a healing partner, two things you, you wanna to listen to them and take them seriously. And then the next question you wanna ask is, do you have a plan? If the person has a plan, chances are they are going to go on to completion. If they don't have a plan, then you have some time and some wiggle room to, you know, but again, so you, you, you do, you wanna know, you be able to call 911, you wanna be able to reach out to your community, it's oftentimes very, very difficult to know yourself. And for those of us who have lost a loved one, and I say us because I've also had that experience of a loved one committing suicide, heal yourself and heal your heart and don't blame yourself because oftentimes you feel very guilty on the other, is there something that I could have done to prevent this? And oftentimes the answer is no. The answer is no. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. No, yes, yes, Carol. I um, mean, uh, Robin Austin. <laughs> Sorry. I just want to um, step away from the diagnostic um, part and say to you, how are you feeling? Mm -hmm. You know, and I just want to offer you just what I love is this brief Buddhist saying that may you be healthy, mm -hmm. may you be happy, and may you be full of peace. This is for you. Um, and may you really find a practice that balances you and that allows you to feel good. Thank you. So we are um, gonna wrap this, uh, this panel up. I'm sure our healers will be around, so if anybody has questions that they weren't able to um, to have addressed, they'll, they'll be hanging around. But um, just like in one minute, if you could, each of you give us a final thought that you would want uh, everyone to take away 
um, with them from this, this session. And I'll start with you, Araka. Um, thank you for this opportunity once again. For those of you interested in my work, my website is maatenterprises.com. That's M-A-A-T enterprises.com. I do personal empowerment. I have four subsidiary companies, personal empowerment, spiritual empowerment, cultural empowerment, and professional empowerment. If, if I were to give you one piece of advice, it would be learn the history. The answers to all of our questions lies in our history. You cannot intelligently define where you are if you don't know how you got there, and you cannot intelligently plan a future until you know where you are. The first exercise I give my personal empowerment clients is retract and replace. If you think anything that doesn't lift you up and move you forward, I don't care what, I'm fat, uh-uh. Retract and replace, I'm delicious. <laughs> I'm delicious. I'm so stupid, retract, replace. I'm smart enough to have gotten where I am in my life and a lot of people ain't here. Whatever it is, any thought, any thought that doesn't lift you up and move you forward, retract it and replace it with a thought that builds life and that heals your mind, your body, and your spirit. Ashe. Dr. Robin Austin. For me, the key thing is take care of yourself. Take, take care of yourself. And what does that mean? How does that look? Um, that means know how this, not only outer body work, but know how the inner body work. Know your energy. Take this moment to allow yourself to see yourself differently, not just as a body, but as pure spirit. Find a yoga community that you feel comfortable in. I'm telling you, it is so important that you understand the power of yoga. Um, I design Ashe because we say it often in our community groups, Ashe, Ashe. But I'm a member also of the Association of Black Psychologists. The question is, what does that word mean? And it means the power to do. It has to do with the will. We need to have the will to want to live, the will to want to be here. Otherwise, we suffer. And so for me, it's important that we look at the fact that we have tools inside of us. Be mindful of the foods that you eat. The research is constantly saying food is medicine. I am a vegetarian, a vegan. I don't eat meat, but it is a transition. No judgment, but realizing that you have a personal responsibility and you have a purpose. We all have a purpose for being here. You are healers. So it's not you and I, when you're in that space and I'm in that space, we all become one. Don't just talk to talk, walk to walk. And by that, I mean, I am a member of Word. And uh -oh. so, uh -oh. I, I, I heard Sarah. Okay, now. I heard Sarah two years ago. I said, I, I, Ashe, two, amen. Two o'clock. Well. I was like, I got to join. When she sees me, I'm a member. I have my t shirt, my bag, I have all my stuff. Join Word. That's right. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Namaste. Yeah. Namaste. 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 Yes. Wow. So thank you to my panelists, fellow co-panelists. I just say ditto what they said. You know, so we're just gonna pass it, pass it down the line. Thank you so much to you, Sarah Lomax Reese, and to the Word family. I'm also a member, yes. Um, <laughs> it is important. Um, many of uh, certainly teachers of both myself and Sarah are talking about the importance of joining affinity groups. And I look at the word family as an affinity group. So I have this resonance to come here. You know, what had me get up, you know, see patients in the morning and then drive 90 miles to be here at 12 o'clock to do Qigong out there is because this is my family. This is my affinity group. This is how I heal. I heal in the context of the love that I'm surrounded with when I come home here to word and to all of you. So thank you for healing me. 
So, and I say that because we heal each other. There's no doubt about it. Um, I would like to in invite all of you to come out on Sunday, September 10th. You're going to steal my, my, I'm not, my but invitation. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to pass it right over here to my sister to the right. <laughs> because these practices, these practices that we've been talking about, you've heard Dr. Robin say it again and again and again, practice, practice, practice. You heard me talk about out there on the terrace. You heard Sister Araka talk about love being a verb. So the practices of Qigong, the practices of yoga, the practice of their active, their verbs, they're where you take you and put you in place and you learn how to change these physiological and mental processes so you can optimize your health and well-being and optimize what it means to be a human being. So I would say... I would invite all of you to tap into your breath. I would like, I want to teach all of you meditation. Um, you can visit me at my website, www.drcarolpenn.com. And my sister here on the right is going to tell you about an event that's going to take here, place here on September 10th. Meditation and your breath is fundamental to your life to your mind, to your body, and your spirit. And I'll just leave it at mm. that, because you're going to hear the rest over here. Yeah, Thank very, you. very, very briefly, because um, I'm, you know, we're at 2.30, and I know a lot of people want to get to this uh, host panel about black media in the age of Trump. Um, but I want to really thank um, our three healers, Araka Ruth Rundu, Dr. Uh, Robin Alston, and Dr. Carol Penn, for their, their time and their wisdom and expertise. Um, I am not a host anymore on, on Word, um, but I did say that I wanted to program the 1 to 4 p.m. slot of Founders Day. And so the two things that I am like incredibly passionate about is healing, this, this mind, body, spirit. I am an avid yoga practitioner. I teach yoga very, sporadically. I'm not like Dr. Alston. I teach once a month. Um, and I'm an avid meditator. And so this conversation is, is like very dear to me. And I'm also, as you all know, very passionate about black media. And so the next panel is about black media in the age of Trump. But um, to, uh, to Dr. Penn's point, I am the co-founder of a people of color meditation community that uh, me and Pamela Freeman started about five or six years ago. And Carol is an active member and participant in that community. And on September 10th, we are bringing a uh, teacher of color in from Seattle who is going to do a day-long meditation retreat with us in, Phil in uh, Germantown. It's from 10 to 4. And um, we invite We'll have to get a bigger place if a lot of people come. <laughs> but, um, but we invite you to come. Meditation is, is like such a powerful mm -hmm. practice. I think the theme was we've got to get our head right. We've got to get our minds right. We have so much power in, 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 in our lives that are specifically connected to our thoughts. And so if we can begin to, to harness that power, we, we can transform our lives and our communities. So thank you all so much for coming out here on Founders Day to acknowledge and celebrate and honor my father, Walter P. Lomax, Jr., MD. Um, this healers panel is, is in recognition and in honor to his healing history and, and, and uh, passion. And um, I just wanna thank all of you for coming and I wanna thank all of you for, for being here today. It means so much to me. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be sitting next to you. I love your energy.